Williams, mayor of Huntington and a candidate for higher office, as they say in the state. Steve, good morning to you, sir. <laughs> good morning, Rob. Good morning. It's good to be with you all. It is, it is great to have you. And boy, has your name been in the news a lot the last 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. uh, nope, no publicity guess, is bad publicity, guess, right? Guess who I had a conversation with about... 10 minutes ago. I'm going to guess Joe Manchin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God love him. Yeah. Can't help but. Joe and I have known each other since the mid 80s when I went into the legislature and have been great friends ever since. And uh, the day after the election, you know, he was so fired up calling me up. Uh, it, it sounded like you'll appreciate this. And I may mention this when we were texting back and forth yesterday, uh, he was coming across as the old football coach. <laughs> yep. All right, Williams, <laughs> you got to get your nose in there. Get in. <laughs> this isn't going to be fun. This is two days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you remember those, Steve, don't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My dad was a coach and, uh, and on two days. Uh, I loved being there. <laughs> dad was coaching down at Concord and, uh, the players would put me in a duffel bag and tie me back up <laughs> in there when I was six or seven years old. Loved it. Oh, mercy. <laughs> they loved it. So if I start to have an appearance of Tourette syndrome oh, on my. occasion, it might be that I'm reflecting back to when they were sticking me down in the duffel bag. <laughs> Not too far away from what politics has become of late oh, anyway. My well, uh, Steve, I can promise you we won't stick you in a duffel bag during this interview, but everything else, I guess, is in bounds. Every, everything else is in there. I'll keep my, keep my two feet in bounds and make sure at now, all times. To catch our listeners up, so Steve, of course, was the uncontested Democratic nominee for governor in the state. Patrick Morrissey emerged from a crowded field on the Republican side, and then seemingly out of nowhere— a field of, I understand, about 20 wealthy Republican donors uh, in the state, I presume they're in the state uh, and confined to that, but could be elsewhere, uh, have put forth a movement to get Joe Manchin to run as a Democratic candidate for governor because they don't want Patrick Morrissey feeling, I presume, that Manchin would have a better chance of beating Morrissey than you, Steve. This had to come as a giant slap in the face to you. Well, uh if they if, if these folks really knew me and they were saying that it would be a slap in the face but they most i presume these folks don't don't know me and i'm endeavoring to get around and make sure that folks do know who i am and what i stand for and what i have what i have done um my experience is is that uh, if you give give me a chance to talk with someone um and they can listen to me um, I'll walk away with 90% of them. But the reality is, is if they hear what I have to say and don't uh, agree or like anything that I'm saying, well, they have no business voting for me. But um, I imagine their concern is is that, uh, well, Williams is only known in the Huntington area. He's not known around around the state. Joe is known everywhere. Um, Joe and I have been friends for 40 years. He's been supporting me. Uh, in, in everything that I've been doing, he supported me throughout the primary and has uh, indicated that he's supporting me in, in the general. And I have no reason to doubt that. You had a conversation with him this morning. I presume that it had to do with this situation and whether or not Joe had any interest. No, Joe just said, Steve, and you know, Joe, Steve, buddy, I, I'm, I'm still with you. I, I'm, I'm still with you. So you just need to make sure that you're getting out and then let people get to know who you are so they can become comfortable with you. That's what I'm doing. And uh, uh, that's why we have a campaign. And particularly if you're introducing yourself uh, statewide, uh, I have been going around the state, but I've just been meeting Democrats. Uh, it's interesting the number of of uh, Republicans who I have been friendly with over the years who are now reaching out and, and, and calling. Um, um, it's it's going to be an active, active campaign, clearly. Um, but I think the more I get out, the more uh, folks that get have an opportunity to be able to get to know who I am, they'll start to become comfortable with my ability to govern and uh, the ability to work with people 
my whole idea is not to have division, is to try to find ways to collaborate. And uh, I've always done that. I've always been able to work on both sides of the aisle and bring independents and others who haven't been involved into the public discourse, get them and get them involved. And uh, there's no reason for me to change the way that I do business now. I just have to make sure that folks have a chance to, to get to meet me and become comfortable with me. Steve, I have tremendous respect for you and your resume, and that's why I cringe when I have to ask you this question, but I have to ask it. If you found that fundraising was a challenge because of this hanging over your head and Senator Manchin changed his mind, would you step aside for Joe Manchin no. if the circumstances dictated it? No. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here for the, for the duration. I'm not going anywhere. Now, that brings me back to the fundraising question. How will it be trying to raise enough funds to run for governor in what is a deepening red state? Uh, that's going to be a, a challenge. And once again, people have to become comfortable with me as they become familiar with me. And uh, um, the, the, the good thing is, is, you know, my background is in the uh, in, in the banking, investment banking, and then the brokerage business, I'm used to talking with, to people who have uh, deep pockets. Um, I've never had to ask it, those individuals for huge contributions, um, but I, I can talk with those folks. I'm convinced they come to understand how I would govern, that I'm fiscally conservative, that I'm constantly looking for limited uh, government i'm trying to make sure that uh, that we are being innovative in what in what we are doing i think they start they will start to develop a comfort level uh, with me um but um, my responsibility and it's nobody's responsibility but my own is to get out and get introduced to folks and let them get a sense as to who i am but I also know, and I learned in business, you have to you have to ask, you have to make the ask, and I will be asking folks to to invest in in my campaign. Now, before my co-host asks you some questions on this, I want to throw a second topic out there as well, and and then I'm sure they'll have questions on both of these for you too, uh, and that has to do with the petition for referendum sure. in regards mm -hmm. to a pro-choice. Uh, opportunity on the ballot and you delivering that petition uh, recently. Can you tell me about this? Yeah. The way the petition came about, I'd had been, as I've been traveling around the state, I've had uh, constantly at every single place, women saying uh, our rights that we have known for the last 50 years have been taken away. Uh, what can you be, what can you do? What will you do to help, Re restore these rights that were present through Roe versus Wade. And uh, interestingly, uh, President, former President Trump made a comment saying that uh, this is in the hands of the people and then let the people speak. Well, at that point, it occurred to me, all right, well, let's let the people speak. I'll take the advice of the, of, of the president. Let's uh, propose that uh, this be placed as a constitutional amendment. The reality is, 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 is this, as I, as I see it, is that uh, I certainly do understand uh, the sensibilities of individuals who are pro-life, um, and, uh, and I re respect that. I think there, there is a, a, a point where um, – Freedom is what we are talking about here. It's not necessarily being pro-choice or, or, or pro-life. It's, it's a matter of the, giving women the freedom to be able to make their, their own uh, health care decisions because particularly as, as, as complex as pregnancy is in, uh, is in women's reproductive health, is something could happen – in the midst of a, preg a pregnancy that goes beyond six weeks, then all of a sudden a woman is placed with the doctor and the doctor knows that the license is going to be placed at risk if they have to make some, some decisions uh, uh, along the way. And um, 
in in that regard, I think that uh, where we are right now is dangerous for women, dangerous for women's health, and um, that uh, what makes more sense is to uh, provide women the ability to be able to sit down with a doctor and be able to make these decisions as to uh, what, what is best. And there there is a point where the state has a vested interest of stepping in, whether it be 15 weeks or 20 weeks, something like that, to be able to say anything beyond this, there, have to, there would have to be some extraordinary measures. But to be able to set, and I think that's one thing that I found when I was in the legislature before and, and certainly more recently, that if you have some limits that are there that uh, we can – can agree upon, then you have the ability. This is health care, and it's assuring women's um, reproductive uh, decisions are within the, the realm of what is legal. And uh, to make anything that is so restrictive that a woman's health is at is at risk, I think it's uh, I think that's unreasonable. And um, I'm suggesting the the constitutional amendment, but beyond anything else, I don't fully expect necessarily that that's going to get on the agenda. I can't imagine that the governor will put it on, and I don't know that it would actually be passed by the uh, – even brought up in a, in a committee. But it will be part of the discussion, and I think that will place freedom on the ballot in November. California, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Vermont, and Ohio have voted on abortion-related constitutional amendments, and the side favoring access to abortion prevailed in each of those states. Interestingly enough. Uh, yeah, well, it is article. interesting, and I just uh, – this isn't an in, intent to open it wide open. It's an intent to give women the opportunity that if there is a very hard decision that has that has to be made and uh, – they find themselves within um, that that their health is at risk, and it's going to risk even possibly. And I'm getting into a lot of other what ifs. But the thing is, is why should, why does the, the state have to sit in on that decision uh, in the doctor's office that a woman is having to make these really hard, hard, hard decisions? I have friends who have gone through this, and they're in. And they have been on um, both sides of of the decision making. And uh, uh, one particular family uh, was told that the baby was uh, was not going to survive as it was being born. And uh, they were um, very, very dedicated to, to uh, pro life decisions. And the uh, the the mother delivered the child and the baby died within minutes after being after being born and uh, they had a funeral with it but this was their decision to be able to make i don't know that this is something that we would that it is the, the necessary for the state to step in on on that decision but they made that decision um, with their family members and with the, with the doctor, and it just seems to me that's the more reasonable approach. Florida, Missouri, and South Dakota also have citizen-sponsored measures on the ballot this year. Matt Miller. So you were hoping that this referendum might get on the ballot in November. If it does not, would that be something that you would push for if you are elected as our governor in November? What I'll be doing is uh, I'll, I'll be... I will be advocating that we need to have a further discussion about this, whether it be um, on the ballot or through through some other means. But I, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think this is something that uh, requires a uh, a more robust uh, discussion and debate uh, within the state. Reality is, if we place it on the agenda and the state and the Voters of the state came back and said, "No, we want uh, uh, we we don't want to, to have a reproductive health amendment to the Constitution." Then the people will have spoken. You mentioned the voters. It was a very poor turnout in the 
primary election. Um, are, is there a concern in your mind as we head into the general election of what that turnout may be and in what is right now a predominantly Republican state, the impact that it might have on you running as a, a Democrat for governor? Well, uh, I do. I really do trust that when uh, former President Trump comes through that there's going to be a huge boost in uh, voter turnout, particularly among Republicans. Um, But I also see that it's my responsibility to to, uh, start creating some some level of uh, enthusiasm as to what we can accomplish in in West Virginia. Um, This is what I, I did when I came into Huntington. Huntington was always known as a never- uh, being able to agree on anything and fighting about everything. And uh, Arch Moore used to say in Huntington, he said, if you go into Huntington and hand out $20 bills, they'll argue about which street corner it needs to, to be on. And what I found is by bringing in a very uh, a- aggressive, innovative, inspirational message as to what we might be able to do and be able to accomplish is that uh, we started to create a bit of a swagger. That's what I'm wanting to do. Whether I'm successful or not, I want to develop a swagger in West Virginia when when we are coming into offices or meeting other individuals and they say uh, they're from West Virginia. I don't want us, anybody in our state, to, to kind of drop their heads with a little bit of shame and say, yeah, uh, we're, yes, we're from West Virginia. So I want us to stand tall, square shoulders, and then people say, oh, you're from West Virginia, and then they hear of the innovation that is occurring within within the state. Um, then that that's the opportunity that I see that we have, and that's really the, the message – it, that, that's not necessarily a policy matter. This is all. This is the way that we approach uh, doing business, as I see in, in West Virginia. And that's in order to be able to start building up uh, a, a, a a much larger vote. I think that naturally occurs, certainly with the presidential race that that is coming in, and with and President Trump coming in. No. Honestly, that doesn't necessarily work into my favor, but I do think that as I that I have a role in being able to create a level of enthusiasm um, for what we are what we are capable of doing, and in doing in doing just that, then that is uh, that that's certainly a responsibility that that I have as a candidate, and I will be able to. I believe I'll be able to demonstrate that's the way I would govern. Jonathan Bodwell. Steve, you have mentioned uh, former President Trump a few times. You have not mentioned Joe Biden. How do you, I mean, there's some ideals and some things coming from the National Party that, that really don't resonate here in West Virginia. How do you differentiate yourself from the National Democratic Party and from the policies of Joe Biden? Well, the National Democratic Party has uh, forgotten and has begun to ignore uh, rural America. Um, and uh, particularly uh, what, I've, what I have been seeing is that it's more of an urban uh, political organization. What I've been saying among the Democrats is that uh, small, small towns are where are the laboratories of innovation, or actually the petri dish for the laboratories of, of, of innovation? And uh, uh, one thing that I have learned is that I can stand toe to toe with any big city mayor in in the nation. I didn't believe that when I first came in. And once again, I kind of would walk meekly into the meetings, and I started finding out after a little while that we could stand shoulder to shoulder with 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 all of them. Um, also, with the mayors, I started finding that uh, you can work with Democrats and Republicans alike, and we can start finding ways to be able to to accomplish things. Um, when President Trump was in office, I regularly, regularly was meeting with cabinet officers in uh, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Commerce, 
um, transportation. I was meeting with the with with those with those folks, the secretaries and the undersecretaries. I mean, there's no reason for me to come in and fight uh, the the president. You play with whoever is who is ever is on the field. Yes, I work with the uh, the Biden administration uh, right now uh, and have found ways to be able to to do things. But I have also said to them that uh, you need to be looking at what's happening at the in the rural areas of, of the nation and see what can be done to be able to lift the nation. My my sense, <laughs> I have sometimes I have a tendency to be able to 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 be looking at things in in such a way that others would not even dare to think. I'm not looking necessarily as to what is happening on the broad scale across the nation, and that we in Appalachia find a way of being able to grab hold on to those. Uh, coattails and be able to move forward towards prosperity. I expect us to set the standard and let the nation for a change hold on to our coattails and start finding, because if we start identifying what we can do here, we can identify sooner what works, quicker what doesn't, and faster how to fix it. That's the advantage that we have in small in a small state, in smaller communities, is that uh, we have talent hiding in, in plain sight, and our ability is, is that uh, we can start identifying in the smallest communities and even the larger populated communities in, in, in our state to be able to move forward. And I think with taking the resources and, and the brain power of West Virginia University, Shepherd University, Marshall University, Concord University, uh, and on and on, all over all over the state, we can start linking things and be able to move into the digital age and uh, not separating ourselves from the industrial age, but the digital age is bringing us opportunities, and I think we have the ability to be able to stand up. But, Steve, I, I apologize for interrupting. We're, we're sure. running out of time. Sorry. But how do you differentiate yourself? You you said the the uh, the Democratic Party is leaving rural America behind. What is what is the point of being a Democrat in rural America? Can you can you ex, you know? Give well, us a the reason on that? is is that uh, one the one thing that is missing in life and in with certainly within politics is loyalty. Every every this is my eleventh campaign, and of the eleven campaigns that I've been in, I've always been a nominee of the Democratic Party. Now, I've always been known as being a fiscally conservative Democrat. Uh, I am who I am, um, but I've, but the Democrats have, over the years, seen fit to always nominate me, and I'm not going to turn on that. Hey, it worked. It, it it's worked for me right now. I'm the only one standing in the in the Democratic Party. So as a result. You know, I, I was able to run uh, unopposed. Other individuals who had decided to switch parties because they thought it worked to, to their advantage to be able to get on the bet. Well, they didn't do so so very well. At least I'm in. I'm the nominee for the party, and I'm in the finals, so to speak. I think and Governor Justice did pretty well with that. Hey, oh, hey yes, um, he Steve, I, I'm out of time. I appreciate yours this morning and your availability this morning when your name is uh, very much in the news. Much appreciated, sir. Thanks, thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you, sir. Hope to talk to you all again soon. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye.